and now a passage from Real Soldiers of Fortune from Chapter 5, General William Walker, the King of the Filibusters. It is safe to say that to members of the younger generation, the name of William Walker conveys absolutely nothing. To them, as a name, William Walker awakens no pride of race or country. It certainly does not suggest poetry and adventure. To obtain a place in even this group of soldiers of fortune, William Walker, the most distinguished of all American soldiers of fortune, the one who but for his own countrymen would have single-handed attained the most far-reaching results, had to wait his turn behind adventurers of other lands and boy officers of his own. And yet, had this man with the plain name, the name that today means nothing, accomplished what he adventured, he would, on this continent, have solved the problem of slavery, have established an empire in Mexico and in Central America, and, incidentally, have brought us into war with all of Europe. That is all he would have accomplished. In the days of gold in San Francisco among the 49ers, William Walker was one of the most famous, most picturesque, and popular figures. Jack Oakhurst, gambler, Colonel Starbottle, duelist, Yuba Bill, stagecoach driver, were his contemporaries. Bret Hart was one of his keenest admirers, and in two of his stories, thinly disguised under a more appealing name, Walker is the hero. When later Walker came to New York City, in his honor, Broadway from the Battery to Madison Square was bedecked with flags and arches. It was roses, roses all the way. The housetops rocked and swayed. In New Orleans, where in a box at the opera he made his first appearance, for ten minutes the performance came to a pause while the audience stood to salute him. This happened less than fifty years ago. And there are men who, as boys, were out with Walker of Nicaragua and who are still active in the public life of San Francisco and New York. Walker was born in 1824 in Nashville, Tennessee. He was the oldest son of a Scotch banker, a man of a deeply religious mind, and interested in a business which certainly is removed, as far as possible, from the profession of arms. Indeed, few men better than William Walker illustrate the fact that great generals are born not trained. Everything in Walker's birth, family tradition, and education pointed to his becoming a member of one of the learned professions. It was the wish of his father that he should be a minister of the Presbyterian Church, and as a child, he was trained with that end in view. He himself preferred to study medicine, and after graduating at the University of Tennessee at Edinburgh, he followed a course of lectures and for two years traveled in Europe, visiting many of the great hospitals. Then, having thoroughly equipped himself to practice as a physician, after a brief return to his native city and as short a stay in Philadelphia, he took down his shingle forever and proceeded to New Orleans to study law. In two years, he was admitted to the bar of Louisiana. But because clients were few, or because the red tape of the law chafed his spirit, within a year, as already he had abandoned the church and medicine, he abandoned his law practice and became an editorial writer on the New Orleans Crescent. A year later, the restlessness which had rebelled against the grave professions led him to the gold fields of California and San Francisco. There, in 1852, at the age of only 28, as editor of the San Francisco Herald, Walker began his real life, which so soon was to end in both disaster and glory. Up to his 28th year, except in his restlessness, nothing in his life foreshadowed what was to follow. Nothing pointed to him as a man for whom thousands of other men from every capital of the world would give up their lives. Negatively, by abandoning three separate callings, and in making it plain that a professional career did not appeal to him, Walker had thrown a certain sidelight on his character, but actively he never had given any hint that under the thoughtful brow of the young doctor and lawyer, there was a mind evolving schemes of empire, and an ambition limited only by the two great oceans. Walker's first adventure was undoubtedly inspired by, and in imitation of, one which at the time of his arrival in San Francisco had just been brought to a disastrous end. This was the De Bourbon expedition into Mexico. The Count Gaston Raoul de Rassuet Bourbon was a young French nobleman and soldier of fortune, a chasseur d'Afrique, a duelist, journalist, dreamer, 
who came to California to dig gold. Baron Hardin Hickey, who was born in San Francisco a few years after Bourbon at the age of 30, was shot in Mexico, also was inspired to dreams of conquest by this same gentleman adventurer. Bourbon was a young man of large ideas. In the rapid growth of California, he saw a threat to Mexico and proposed to that government as a buffer state between the two republics to form a French colony in the Mexican state of Sonora. Sonora is that part of Mexico which directly joins on the south with our state of Arizona. The president of Mexico gave Bourbon permission to attempt this, and in 1852, he landed at Gaimas in the Gulf of California with 260 well-armed Frenchmen. The ostensible excuse of Bourbon for thus invading foreign soil was his contract with the president under which his emigrants were hired to protect other foreigners working in the Restauradora mines from the attacks of Apache Indians from our own Arizona. But there is evidence that back of Bourbon was the French government, and that he was attempting, in his small way, what was later attempted by Maximilian, backed by a French army corps and Louis Napoleon, to establish in Mexico an empire under French protection. For both the filibuster and the emperor, the end was the same, to be shot by the fusillade against a church wall. In 1852, two years before Bourbon's death, which was the finale to his second filibustering expedition into Sonora, he wrote to a friend in Paris, Europeans are disturbed by the growth of the United States, and rightly so. Unless she be dismembered, unless a powerful rival be built up beside her, i.e. France and Mexico, America will become, through her commerce, her trade, her population, her geographical position upon two oceans, the inevitable mistress of the world. In ten years, Europe dare not fire a shot without her permission. As I write, fifty Americans prepare to sail for Mexico and go perhaps to victory. Voilà les États-Unis. These fifty Americans who, in the eyes of Bourbon, threatened the peace of Europe, were led by the ex-doctor, ex-lawyer, ex-editor William Walker, aged 28 years. Walker had attempted, but had failed to obtain from the Mexican government such a contract as the one it had granted de Bourbon. He accordingly sailed without it, announcing that whether the Mexican government asked him to do so or not, he would see that the women and children on the border of Mexico and Arizona were protected from massacre by the Indians. It will be remembered that when Dr. Jameson raided the Transvaal, he also went to protect women and children from massacre by the Boers. Walker's explanation of his expedition, in his own words, is as follows. He writes in the third person, What Walker saw and heard satisfied him that a comparatively small body of Americans might gain a position on the Sonora frontier and protect the families on the borders from the Indians, and such an act would be one of humanity whether or not sanctioned by the Mexican government. The condition of the upper part of Sonora was at that time, and still is, he was writing eight years later in 1860, a disgrace to the civilization of the continent, and the people of the United States were more immediately responsible before the world for the Apache outrages. Northern Sonora was, in fact, more under the dominion of the Apaches than under the laws of Mexico, and the contributions of the Indians were collected with greater regularity and certainty than the dues of the tax gatherers. The state of this region furnished the best defense for any American aiming to settle there without the formal consent of Mexico, and although political changes would certainly have followed the establishment of a colony, they might be justified by the plea that any social organization, no matter how secured, is preferable to that in which individuals and families are altogether at the mercy of savages. While at the time of Jameson's raid, the women and children in danger of massacre from the Boers were as many as there are snakes in Ireland, at the time of Walker's raid, the women and children were in danger from the Indians who, as enemies, as Walker soon discovered, were as cruel and as greatly to be feared as he had described them.
But it was not to save women and children that Walker sought to conquer the state of Sonora. At the time of his expedition, the great question of slavery was acute, and if in the states next to be admitted to the Union slavery was to be prohibited, the time had come. So it seemed to the statesman of twenty-eight years, when the South must extend her boundaries and for her slaves find an outlet in fresh territory. Sonora already joined Arizona. By conquest, her territory could easily be extended to meet Texas. As a matter of fact, strategically, the spot selected by William Walker for the purpose for which he desired it was almost perfect. Throughout his brief career, one must remember that the spring of all his acts was this dream of an empire where slavery would be recognized. His mother was a slaveholder. In Tennessee, he had been born and bred, surrounded by slaves. His youth and manhood had been spent in Nashville and New Orleans. He believed as honestly as fanatically in the right to hold slaves as did his father in the faith of the Covenanters. Today one reads his arguments in favor of slavery with the most curious interest. His appeal to the humanity of his reader, to his heart, to his sense of justice, to his fear of God, and to his belief in the Holy Bible, not to abolish slavery but to continue it, to this generation is as amusing as the topsy-turvyisms of Gilbert or Shaw. But to the young man himself, slavery was a sacred institution intended for the betterment of mankind, a God-given benefit to the black man, and a God-given right of his white master. White brothers in the South, with perhaps less exalted motives, contributed funds to fit out Walker's expedition. And in October 1852, with 45 men, he landed at Cape St. Lucas at the extreme point of Lower California. Lower California, it must be remembered, in spite of its name, is not a part of our California, but then was and still is a part of Mexico. The fact that he was at last upon the soil of the enemy caused Walker to throw off all pretense, and instead of hastening to protect women and children, he sailed a few miles farther up the coast to La Paz. With his 45 followers, he raided the town, made the governor a prisoner, and established a republic with himself as president. In a proclamation, he declared the people free of the tyranny of Mexico. They had no desire to be free, but Walker was determined, and whether they liked it or not, they woke up to find themselves an independent republic. A few weeks later, although he had not yet set foot there, Walker annexed on paper the state of Sonora, and to both states gave the name of the Republic of Sonora. As soon as word of this reached San Francisco, his friends busied themselves in his behalf, and the danger-loving and adventurous of all lands were enlisted as emigrants and shipped to him in the bark Anita. Two months later, in November 1852, 300 of these joined Walker. They were as desperate a band of scoundrels as ever robbed a sluice, stoned a Chinaman, or shot a greaser. When they found that to command them there was only a boy, they plotted to blow up the magazine in which the powder was stored, rob the camp, and march north, supporting themselves by looting the ranches. Walker learned of their plot, tried the ringleaders by court-martial, and shot them. With a force as absolutely undisciplined as was his, the act required the most complete personal courage. That was a quality the men with him could fully appreciate. They saw they had, as a leader, one who could fight, and one who would punish. The majority did not want a leader who would punish, so when Walker called upon those who would follow him to Sonora to show their hands, only the original 45 and about 40 of the later recruits remained with him. With less than 100 men, he started to march up the peninsula through Lower California and so around the Gulf to Sonora. From the very start, the filibusters were overwhelmed with disaster. The Mexicans, with Indian allies, skulked on the flanks and rear. Men who, in the almost daily encounters, were killed, fell into the hands of the Indians, and their bodies were mutilated. Stragglers and deserters were run to earth and tortured. Those of the filibusters who were wounded died from lack of medical care. The only instruments they possessed with which to extract the arrowheads were probes made from ramrods filed to a point. Their only food was the cattle they killed on the march. The army was barefoot, the cabinet in rags. The president of Sonora wore one boot and one shoe. Unable to proceed farther, Walker fell back upon San Vicente, where he had left the arms and ammunition of the deserters at a rear guard of 18 men. He found not one of these 
to welcome him. A dozen had deserted, and the Mexicans had surprised the rest, lassoing them and torturing them until they died. Walker now had but 35 men. To wait for further reinforcements from San Francisco, even were he sure that reinforcements would come, was impossible. He determined by forced marches to fight his way to the boundary line of California. Between him and safety were the Mexican soldiers holding the passes and the Indians hiding on his flanks. When within three miles of the boundary line at San Diego, Colonel Melendres, who commanded the Mexican forces, sent in a flag of truce and offered if they would surrender, a safe conduct to all of the survivors of the expedition, except the chief. But the men who for one year had fought and starved for Walker would not, within three miles of home, abandon him. Melendrez then begged the commander of the United States troops to order Walker to surrender. Major McKinstry, who was in command of the United States Army post at San Diego, refused. For him to cross the line would be a violation of neutral territory. On Mexican soil, he would neither embarrass the ex-president of Sonora nor aid him, but he saw to it that if the filibusters reached American soil, no Mexican or Indian should follow them. Accordingly, on the imaginary boundary he drew up his troop, and, like an impartial umpire, awaited the result. Hidden behind rocks and cactus across the hot, glaring plain, the filibusters could see the American flag and the gay, fluttering guidance of the cavalry. The sight gave them heart for one last desperate spurt. Melendrez also appreciated that for the final attack, the moment had come. As he charged, Walker apparently routed, fled, but concealed in the rocks behind him, he had stationed a rear guard of a dozen men. As Melendrez rode into this ambush, the dozen riflemen emptied as many saddles, and the Mexicans and Indians stampeded. A half hour later, footsore and famished, the little band that had set forth to found an empire of slaves, staggered across the line and surrendered to the forces of the United States. Of this expedition, James Jeffrey Roche says, in his Byways of War, which is of all books published about Walker the most intensely and fascinatingly interesting and complete, years afterward, the peon herdsman or prowling Cocupa Indian in the mountain bypaths stumbled over the bleaching skeleton of some nameless one whose resting place was marked by no cross or cairn. But the colt's revolver resting beside his bones spoke his country and his occupation, the only relic of the would-be conquistadors of the 19th century. If you enjoy High Americana, please head on over to Patreon, where you can support the channel and audio requests can be made. Thank you.